Good morning, everyone. My name is David Cerna, and I'm here from the Cal team. We have a great webinar for you this morning. This is all about hypothesis and increasing engagement in the classroom with collaborative annotation. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Amanda Huron and Dr. Jasmine Noel Yarish from CAS here today to talk about their experiences with hypothesis and hopefully encourage you to get started with using this and really learn some tips from both of them. So our goal today is really to get you started with using Hypothesis, answer any questions that you may have, and really increase student engagement and learn from real use case examples. Now, before we get started, I just briefly wanna go over the Zoom controls on your screen. If you look at your toolbar in the lower left corner, you'll see the unmute and the start video icons. Feel free to unmute throughout or go ahead and start your video if you would like. You can also use the chat box. We will be looking at that throughout this workshop today. Click on the chat icon and reactions. If you do want to give a thumbs up or a clap, you can go ahead and do that by clicking on the reaction button. If you do want to change the skin tone, go to the three dots in the lower right corner and you'll see in the lower right, a little thumbs up icon, click on that. You're able to change the skin tone right there. Now our agenda for our workshop today, first we'll talk about how to access Hypothesis. I'll give a brief walkthrough on how to access this within Blackboard and faculty discussion. We'll have Dr. Yarish and Dr. Huron talk about their uses of Hypothesis in the classroom and next steps plus Q&A. Let's get started. So what is Hypothesis? Now, Dr. Huron brought this to UDC, which is wonderful. Hypothesis is a great social annotation tool that really makes readings come more alive. You can use web pages or online articles, PDFs, or open textbooks or OER resources. So first, Hypothesis makes reading really active. We use this throughout our trainings here on the Cal team to really have our participants interact with one another and also learn from one another. A really great thing about Hypothesis is that you can add memes, you can add GIFs, you can add YouTube videos, anything that you would like. You can also highlight text or notes for yourself as well. And you can look at this quote, I want students to learn the profits and pleasures of careful, engaged reading. To cultivate this kind of reading and learning, I've tried a lot of previous annotation tools, but Hypothesis finally delivers on the promise of digital annotation. I love that quote. It also makes reading more visible. Their annotations give me a window to their thoughts and understandings that I couldn't access otherwise. I wouldn't get this depth of interaction in a threaded discussion. And remember when you are using Hypothesis, you're able to see these annotations. Your students can also see the annotations that other students have left and respond to them or ask questions. Last, it does make it more social. Hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone, right? So you can also see who in the classroom has the same thoughts as you as well. So let me briefly go over how to access Hypothesis within Blackboard. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. And you'll see right here, I have a copy of my Ultra Sandbox. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that Books and Tools. Click on that. And you need to scroll down to see Hypothesis. Once I go right here, can't find what you need, browse all course tools, click on that. And then you'll see Hypothesis. And what you want to do is click on this plus sign right here. Now, once I click on the plus sign, you'll see that Hypothesis is, is added as a content piece within Blackboard. Of course, I can make this visible to students once I'm ready, but let me click on this. And there are some options here on how to upload your content. Now, first one is you can enter the URL of a web page or PDF. If you find an article online, let's say from the New York Times or Time, you can go ahead and put that there. You can also select a PDF from Blackboard. You can save files to Blackboard and use that. You can select a PDF from Google Drive, but let's talk about OneDrive since we are connected with Microsoft 365. I'll go ahead and click on that. Now you may not be able to see the pop-up on my screen, but that will show me my OneDrive account. And I'll go ahead and choose a PDF file from there. So I selected a HyFlex article that's PDF. You can make this a group assignment. We do have a webinar specifically about group assignments and hypothesis, 
but let me just go ahead and click on continue. Now what you'll see is you'll see that HyFlex article already on the screen preloaded, and I can scroll through the entire article and I can add some annotations. So what I like to do is add some guiding questions for my students or for participants in a training first, so they have some things to respond to. So for example, I'll go ahead and highlight this first one and I'll make an annotation here. And I'll say, what is your experience teaching in the high flex mode? Right, and I can go ahead and add a tag. Let's go to high flex and I'll just post it. So now you can see right here, I have my first annotation and it's also tagged as high flex. And now anyone can respond to this guiding question. So this is how you annotate within Blackboard and you can connect any PDF or website links. Are there any questions about this before we continue? Okay, excellent. So we'll go ahead and segue into our faculty discussion with Dr. Yarish and Dr. Huron. They are amazing professors that I work with quite often. And I know Dr. Yarish also teaches in the high flex mode, so she can also speak upon that as well. So Dr. Huron and Dr. Yarish, thank you so much for joining me today. So I did wanna start a conversation before you start sharing how you're using Hypothesis. But first question is, why did you start using Hypothesis in the first place in your courses? Well, I can start with that, I guess. Um, and I, I started using Hypothesis in the fall of 2020 um, when you know we had had to make this major shift to online learning. And I was, I was brainstorming with um, a group of friends that I went to graduate school with who are now teaching all over the country about ways that we can um, maybe try to turn the online thing to our advantage a little bit. So we're really trying to think, okay, what new possibilities does this open up, this requirement that we're now everything is just online all the time. Um, and one thing that, that people started talking about was um, what was this kind of, this idea of, of enabling students to kind of read collaboratively in a shared online kind of way. And so there were a few different programs that people were mentioning. Um, and for whatever reason, the hypothesis seemed to be the one that seemed most um, compelling to me. So um, that was the one that I kind of checked out and then talked to Fatma and you all um, about getting um, here at UDC. And so, it, but to me, it was um, exciting to think about, okay, if, if class is going to consist of a situation like this, where we are, you know, together remotely, um, but it's very, very easy to share a screen, and it's very easy to kind of, um, to, to, to share not only the screen in the class situation, but everyone is sort of forced to be online all the time. Okay, so then all the readings, it's, 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 it's easier to expect students to do their readings online. Um, and then that naturally lends itself to this kind of collaborative note taking and commenting. So that was why I started using it was because I just wanted to figure out a way to make something creative come out of <laughs> the, the move to online teaching and learning. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Garish. So I joined UDC's faculty in fall of 2020. So th there's a similar timeline to how this works, but I actually didn't start using Hypothesis in my courses until spring of 2020. 21 um, and that coincides with being one of the um, one of the professors who actually jumped on board when we first did the pilot for um, Blackboard Ultra so everybody knows that we've now shifted LMS platforms in the time span but we were also going virtual so I'm sure everybody is like these are growing pains I don't want to think about it but actually I was thinking about it in, in a real sense so I was teaching at two separate institutions the two years prior. I went through four transitions of LMSs in three years, and I wanted to get onto the Ultra platform as soon as possible because when I knew I was coming to UDC, I actually started experimenting with the Ultra platform for free during summer of 2020. But when I got here, we were using Learn, and I was so annoyed and disappointed. <laughs> but one of the features in Learn that I actually gravitated towards for collaborative uh, work for students in the virtual kind of sense that I really took on to, you know, um, to increase engagement was the course wiki 
assignment that existed in Learn that no longer exists in the Blackboard mm -hmm. um, Ultra version. So I, I was talking with Dr. Huron about, you know, hypothesis and talking to the, the Cal team, and I wanted to shift and actually try to see if I could use it in that sense. Now, um, I'll be talking, I'll show a little bit about how I did that transition when we do our demonstration, so I'm going to focus on that today. But that's kind of what got me started using Hypothesis. I really liked the course wiki because it was collaborative, but not a group assignment. Um, it was a collective grading function. Um, and Hypothesis can also create those kind of sentiments as well. Not perfectly, it's not a perfect shift, but it was a, a helpful shift in my sense. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And for both of you as professors, did you find that this did increase engagement in your classroom with readings? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it really did. Um, it would have been interesting to offer two sections of the same class at the same yeah. time and have one with hypothesis and one without. Um, that would have been a, that still could be an interesting experiment to conduct, I think. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really impressed with the level of student um, response and engagement, and, and uh, you know, obviously, we'll sh I'll share some of those when we get to that point. But um, there was really some serious uh, engagement with the text that was really, really cool to see. So, yes, that's that's why I became kind of a convert because that, that first, after that first semester, I was like, oh my god, this is like actually really powerful. And um, and I think I'm, I should certainly you know learned what to do better you know in the next times that I used it, but. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of potential there for really increasing engagement in reading and for students to kind of teach each other how to read, really, mm -hmm. which is super cool. <laughs> yeah, and as we've seen, I mean, I just participated in um, the Philadelphia Writing Projects Conference, the celebration of um, writing and literacy, and it was just held at the University of Pennsylvania uh, two weekends ago. And one of the things that I definitely saw there and the majority of people there are K through 12 instructors, but they also include college professors. Um, the This concept of um, literacy and reading and writing is something that's collaborative. It helps others. Peer-to-peer um, -peer teaching is really, really important. And Hypothesis definitely does that. Now, I, I just as um, Dr. Huron said, I can't exactly say if it's increased in engagement mm -hmm. because I haven't been able, I don't have any, um, uh, you know, way to test that because I don't have a control. But what I can say is that the more the students use it over the course of the semester, the more um, I see them developing in it. Um, and I, I, could, I start to see their critical reading skills increase, um, and, and definitely. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where I would put that one. Yeah, I do like that, you know, it takes reading from just kind of an individual activity or solo activity and really makes it kind of a group or social social activity, right? So it just increases that fun that you're having with the reading. So I appreciate your insight. Uh, second question is, what are some getting started tips for other faculty with hypothesis that you would like to share? Yeah, I'll jump on that one first and give a minute a second. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, you can do um, if you are really tentative about launching it in your class before you try it out. Um, Blackboard has an organization function and it's really easy to create an organization amongst your program where maybe for a program meeting you, you do a hypothesis uh, assignment for your program um, meeting. You can share like a syllabus um, or share each other syllabi. So the organization's portion of Blackboard Ultra can be really, really helpful for that and getting started. Um, uh, one of the things that I help get my students started in reading and using Hypothesis is in the first week we do a read the syllabus together kind of thing. So I tell them to find one thing that they're excited about in the syllabus and one thing that they have a question about in the syllabus. So then they can highlight that for me and I can, you know, clarify if necessary in the next meeting or we can clarify together or they can actually clarify for each other which is kind of cool sometimes that happens as well so getting started with hypothesis you really just have to start playing with it one safe way to play with it is as i said that organization um, structure or of course in any of the great cow led um, developments and sandboxes those are also helpful but it's helpful to have somebody else, right? A group of people in a platform. So that's why I would suggest like the organizations. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought that up, Dr. Garsh. So if you are interested in starting an organization on Blackboard, I did put the request form in the chat box. Um, you can also email us at calhelpdesk at udc.edu if you have any questions. And Dr. Hura. 
Great, yeah. I mean, I would um, echo Dr. Yarish in terms of um, working with the syllabus. That's been really great for my students, and especially um, when we were, you know, we're no longer in the emergency rote, emergency remote instruction kind of time. Um, but when we were, what I would have students do um, on the first day of class, um, I would share my screen with the syllabus in Hypothesis, you know, as it would have been posted to Blackboard through Hypothesis. And then the students all, I sort of instructed them in real time how they could also, through Blackboard, log in, get to the syllabus, and then start commenting. So we were doing live annotation of the syllabus all jointly together. And you know, you just have to click the little refresh button and you start to see everybody's comments pop up. And that was really cool because it was a way for students to both become familiar with the syllabus, um, but also learn how to use hypothesis like together in the moment. Um, and so that was that was really a fun thing to do. Um, now that because we're now we're no longer kind of remote in that way, that might not necessarily work. On the other hand, many students bring laptops to class, you could easily kind of still do that together in class, kind of a live annotation um, of, of the syllabus to kind of get the class started using hypothesis. Um, so yeah, that was, and I think because it's right, I mean, it's just what, what uh, Dr. Yarish was saying, I mean, it's like you, it's, it's playing with it, you know, it's kind of like, you know, oh, and I very quickly had students realize like, oh, I can post an image, oh, I can post a link to a video, oh, I can like go to Wikipedia, which we all know, you know, that's not like a source we would reference in our research papers, but, you know, just to get a little more information about a person, a name that comes up in the, um, in the in the reading, you know, maybe I can find a little bit more about that person and share it with my classmates in the in in the comment section. So, um, so yeah, but I do think starting with the syllabus is a great sort of easy way to get started, and specifically asking for questions about the syllabus is great. Yeah, I, that's a great idea to start with the syllabus as that kind of opening activity that's very low stakes or no stakes for the students just to get used to using hypothesis. Thank you so much. So I do see uh, some questions in the chat box if both of you can answer these. I'll read Andrew's first. Do you evaluate student activity on hypothesis using a rubric? Sounds like because the behavior is visible via annotation, it should actually be translatable to a rubric that shows level of quality of such behavior as indicating mastery of learning outcomes. I think that's a really good question. So there's one thing I want to say about there is one weird hiccup around grading with hypothesis, and that is there's a set points within the hypothesis platform. It's always going to be out of 10. However, I make my hypothesis um, assignments very, very low stakes. I only make them out of two points, um, typically. And depending on the class, those two points mean something else. And the class that I'm going to show you today, you'll actually see what that is um, around the rubric. So there is a because it's two points, I definitely have a rubric. They have to do two things. And if they don't do the thing, they don't get that point. If they do do the thing, they get the one point. But I, they get half, right, if they're not doing both. So if I made it actually out of 10 points like Hypothesis does, I probably would make a rubric for them. But I have never done that because it's not, It's to me, it's a very low stakes assignment, not a bigger high stakes assignment. However, I do think that it could be used in that, in that way. Um, I do think that, um, uh, you know, this is the, you know, Ravi Sinta has the same question about rubric. I do think that um, it creates uh, some, some grading issues and it is a lot of just going in and checking and grading and things. So there is that, but if you use it as a low stakes assignment, a very low stakes assignment, I think it's very effective um, for the majority of students. And that's not to say that there are so many students who do not open it. Um, and the last thing I'll say about one of the challenges for hypothesis is if a student is not using a computer, if they're trying to do this on their mobile phone, it's a real big challenge. It doesn't always, the annotation function doesn't always work. So um, through, through like the Blackboard uh, through Blackboard's uh, Learn. So that's another kind of challenge that is out there with using it. But again, um, we've always told our students it's much better to be able to do your assignments on a computer. You cannot rely just on a mobile phone um, to, to actually successfully complete a class. So those are kind of the two things that I would say around rubrics um, and kind of some of the hiccups that come with the grading functions of Hypothesis and some of the limitations. Yeah, what I'm hearing is like it's great for those low stakes assignments. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Uh, Dr. Huron, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add that I, I definitely um, think of it as a low stakes kind of assignment. I do grade 
um, but it's 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 not a huge um, percentage of the final grade at all. Um, and it's tricky because you know students. It, 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 what we're really wanting students to do is to engage deeply with with the reading and to kind of ask questions and 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 kind of um, you know do all sorts of things. I do have um, a set of expectations in the syllabus for for how for you know suggestions for focusing for students for focusing their comments. And when I was first starting to think about using hypothesis and I um, looked at some of the information they have on their website, which I think is very helpful in terms of kind of trying to think some of this stuff through. I mean, there's different takes on this. So there are some faculty who say, you know, I like, I don't want to ask for a specific thing. I just want them to read and kind of see what they come up with, what they generate. So that's kind of one way to go. Another way to go is to request a much more specific kind of response. Um, so I've tried doing it both ways and I think both ways have their benefits. Um, and it, and it is true that, you know, some students are going to really take it to the extra, you know, next level in terms of the thoughtfulness of their responses and some not quite so much. Um, so, but I think, um, the key thing is that students are reading and they're responding to what they see in the text. They're responding to each other. Um, and I think at least for, for me, for now, keeping it a pretty low stakes reading and writing assignment um, has been important, but I'm very happy to share the um, expectations that I lay out in the syllabus for the um, for hypothesis. Excellent. And we'll get to one question before both of you uh, give your example. So uh, Kathy Meals, uh, maybe you'll get to this later, but have you found hypothesis works better for in-class activities or outside of class assignments? So I'll take a jump on that, mm -hmm. um, mostly because it's hard to engage it's hard for me to engage that question outside of the kind of mode that i teach in mm -hmm. so i teach in high flex and i teach all my classes in the high flex now um and i will be teaching all of my classes in high flex going forward as long as i'm here at udc um and there's a reason for that uh the reason for that has everything to do with meeting our students where they are uh, meeting our students where they where they can show up as their best selves and if you know anything about the high flex mode, the foundation of that is a really, really good online asynchronous syllabus. So I think of the, all of my hypothesis assignments as you can be doing this in class while we're in class doing the activity that we're doing. You can do this outside of class. If you don't make class, you can still do it and still get credit for it. So to me, it's hard to measure if I've found one works better or the other because I don't disaggregate that based off of the model and mode that I teach in. Um, now, I do think that um, the hypothesis can be really great if you organize it as a workshop, if you do it in class, and then have the students later, um, by, the end of this, by the end of the week, go back in and respond to somebody, right? So they do their first annotation in class, and then they have to read it over the weekend and respond to someone else. We've done that with discussion boards. It's the same kind of idea. You're just using, you're, you're focusing more on, on, on reading than you are with um, discussion board kind of um, engagement. But I do think that if you have a good rubric for discussion boards, you could easily adapt that for your hypothesis assignments. Thank you. Dr. Heron? Um. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. And I do think in a high flex class, this is so perfectly suited for that. Um, I have been teaching in person um, I, since when, I guess, since last spring. Um, and so when I've been, I, so I've, I have really been using it kind of as an outside of class um, activity. And so um, students, it's, you know, it's, you know, every day when there's a reading, I mean, it's just kind of like, that's what they do every day when they, you know, the reading for class is they must, you know, make the comments and hypothesis um, to, in order to prepare for class the next day. And so um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, just like you do the reading to prepare to come to class. And part of that is, is writing the comments and hypothesis. I will also say that it is as a, as an instructor, it's really um, helpful. I mean, I, it's very helpful to, you know, then go into hypothesis the morning before class after the comments are due and just get a sense of what students have gotten out of the reading. I mean, that that to me, you know, um, is just so powerful. And I, you know, I 
have experimented, I've traditionally required students to write reading responses for readings. Um, so this is a little bit different because it's not a, a separate reading response, it's interspersed within the reading. Um, but the great thing about the hypothesis approach is, of course, that other students are seeing students' responses to the reading. So, um, but it is helpful for me, even thinking more traditionally in terms of like, you go home, you do your homework, then you come to class. Um, it is really helpful to have that discussion gotten started already. And then there are things I, I in class, what I do sometimes in class is I'll, with the projector, I will share the screen I, I will share the reading and I'll say, look, um, Marcus pointed out this in the reading. Um, you know, do you want to elaborate on that, Marcus? Does anyone want to respond? That kind of thing. So we can um, use it in class that way. But that's, you know, presuming students have done it ahead of time. Excellent. Thank you. And these are great questions from the participants today. Thank you so much for that. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And then both of you can start going over some of your examples. So who would like to start? Okay, so I saw uh, Dr. Yarsh point at you, Dr. Huron. So go ahead. <laughs> I'll start. Sure. Um, so you know, I just have, I have a. There's many examples, but the one, one I will start with is from, um, a class I taught in the fall of 2020, Politics of Urban Housing. So this was a semester that was my first time, um, using hypothesis, and um, so this is. An example of an academic piece um, that's about kind of thinking theoretically about housing and concepts of housing and dwelling. Um, and as we see here, um, so this is um, what we what we've got on the side are the students' comments. Um, so you can see at the top um, 39 annotations. So that's actually not that many. <laughs> Sometimes I have a lot more. Um, there were, I can't remember, I think there were about uh, 15 students in this class. But so you can see what we see here is that um, if I'm hovering my mouse over here on this comment, it, it highlights in blue over here, if, if my, so I can kind of see, and I can see the beginning of, you know, what the, what she's highlighted, the student has highlighted. Um, so, and so she's just commenting here on this, on this line, on the role that housing oops plays. And then, um, and then we can see replies. So um, I have made a not very interesting reply, right? I'm just like, cool, interesting point. Um, but another student has made a more substantive reply there. So you could also, um, you know, in terms of reply, you could require, I usually require students to not just make comments, but also reply to a certain number of their, their peers. Um, and so this is kind of what it looks like. I can also, I could scroll through and see everything that's been highlighted over here. And if I, you know, let's say I scroll down to this, section and I want to see what this student commented on here I click here and it jumps to it over here on the right hand side so I can see how this student responded um, I can see my response um, and so this is kind of the, the, the basic setup of it I would say I can click over here to show all and now I can see all the annotations come back up um, and so that's that's just kind of a general overview, I would say, of how it works. Um, and, and and the other thing, and one thing I haven't done at Jasmine, I don't know if you've done this, but students have an ability actually to to tag, I think. Um, and, and so you, you could you could require that would be it. I mean, this is something I have not done, but you could require students to tag a comment with a certain word. Um, and then you could go back through and see, well, who tagged everything with, you know, a certain word. And, and that, that could be a way to kind of generate some really interesting discussion. Um, so that's that's one example. And then another one, and this was, I was using it in a slightly different way here. Um, and this was, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second so I can um, pull this up. But a, um, ah, shoot. Do you want me to go to one of mine while you work on yours? Uh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So one of the things that I'll just go ahead and oh, 
share this screen. I was looking, Andrew had a great question and I couldn't, I was trying to see if there was anything out there research wise about introverts and social annotation, but I couldn't find that. So, <laughs> so great research question. Um, one of the things I wanted to show a little bit of while um, Dr. Heron is finding her stuff is the kind of uh, translation that I did for um, the class that I taught fall 2020, which I taught and learned um, around the course wiki and then into um, the class, the same class that I'm teaching now, but in the ultra kind of version. So I'm going to go over to this. I'm showing from student preview just so you guys can see it from the student's perspective, um, what it kind of looks like. So if I go to my course wiki, right, and I click on it, this is the old version. What I have here is the readings and the episode that uh, they, they were watching in relationship to that reading of that week. So I'm going to pick, um, let's pick, we'll just stick with the Angela Davis one because this is a really good one. So I put the overview and purpose up on, on the wiki. What's the overview and the purpose of this wiki? It's designed for students to collectively define key terms in the reading. So it's really associated around terms, but also to build preliminary connections between the, that text and Orange is the New Black season one episode. I wasn't ready. So I give a bio of the author, tell them who this person is. I've linked, you know, something about them in public media so they can get a kind of a sense of who that is. So then the students, right, I have the terms laid out and they go in and they edit it. They put in their, their, their quotes, they put in the definitions as they see them from the piece. So the intention here was getting them to really critically read, to find the actual definitions from the author themselves. Um, and that was a key point. So, right, we have prison industrial complex, migrating corporations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can go all the way down. And then I have the questions. I gave some content questions about the episode and then also an application question about kind of connecting the reading to the episode. So that's what it looked like in the course wiki. Students did a pretty good job on it. They do this editing kind of function and that's kind of cool. Um, but I lost that capacity when we moved over to learn. So I wanted to find a way to adapt this. So let's go here. This is the same kind of materials week. Here's the what it looks like in Blackboard Ultra. So when you click on it, it comes out from the side. It's really important to remind students to hit the launch button <laughs> because um, if it is an assignment that's graded, they have to launch it in order for the grade book to connect to it. So when it's, it launches in, in Ultra, it pulls the, the piece out from the left and you have the annotations on the right. So as you guys probably remember, um, right, so I have the whole piece here um, from my wiki. So I gave them a bio, but you can actually put pictures in Hypothesis as well, which is kind of really cool. You can annotate it with pictures, with links. So that bio, I would I put in a picture for the students. It's the same bio, copied and paste it from my learn, made sure I add that link um, for the time article so they have it. So they have like a little bit of sense, but I've annotated it for them so when they see the author's name right now they can identify where the author's name is on a on a text which is really really helpful um all right i'm going to show all again so I, there's this also this function called page notes where you can put directions for students and i tend to use the page notes functions to give them directions and here is what i would call my rubric for the hypothesis annotation so again you have the aim right at the front and then I tell them for the first point you'll be asked to focus on the content of the reading find one of the following concepts and use annotate to note the definition of the term to note the definition um, and then of course only only new contributions to the collective annotation will receive full credit so make sure to refresh um, and skim prior annotations in case students are doing it later so I have the whole list and then for the second point, return to the reading after you watch the episode and formulate a, an application question or respond to an application question posted by your peer. Dr. JNY, me, has provided an example of such an application. Just look for a tag application question. So as Amanda was saying about this like whole tagging thing, you can have, you can go down and find a tag, right? So like, I'm just gonna keep looking for my tags. I think there's a way to find tags faster, but here it is, application question right here. So we have a question. I can click to the highlighted version, right? So I highlighted a piece of text. How does Piper's decision to surrender relate to Davis's conception of prison as ideology? Here's how Davis describes prison as ideology. I'm having them connect it. So that's kind of how I applied 
um, this. And of course, we have a bunch of students who responded to my question, which is great. And there are also students who created their own questions and then they've responded to those as well. So I'll, we'll turn it back over to Dr. Huron. Awesome, I love that. I love how you did that. Um, what I was gonna show next is just, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, technical uh, way to use hypothesis, which I've actually found to be kind of helpful. Um, so in my DC politics class last spring, um, one of the things that I had students read was the DC Home Rule Act, which is legislation um, from 1974, um, actually 1973. It is 117 pages long. It is a very dry, you know, it's, it's, it's like an act. I mean, it's, it's very dry legislation. Um, and I, you know, it's very long and I thought, okay, students need to, you know, we're talking about DC politics. We, we need to understand home rule. We need to, and, and let's like dig into this, like kind of obtuse legal language. Let's just look at the original document, you know, which is this home rule act. Um, but I thought, you know, I don't want to actually require them to read all 117 pages. It just seemed like a little bit too much. So I said, I said, okay, I've got whatever it was. It was 10 or 12 students in the class. I just divided up the reading into sections and had what I required them to do was for each student to read 10 or 12 pages of, of the act and to kind of draw out the, what they thought were some of the important elements or interesting elements. And so, you know, I'll just share my screen again so you can see that. Um, but, but basically, you know, so we've got this Home Rule Act. One student has highlighted this, just even this phrase, Home Rule. What is it? He's defined it over here. Um, and so here we've got a lot more. Yeah, we've got a, about 100 annotations, 104 annotations. And so the idea here was that, um, was to really collectively read in a somewhat different sense so that each student read one section of this. Um, and then in class, we were able to, you know, high, we were able to discuss those things that the students had highlighted so that students could get an overall sense of what this act says, why it's important, um, how it, how it's kind of framed um, modern DC political history, um, but it was it was sort of using using hypothesis in that in a slightly different way. So it's um, it's not so much about understanding the scope of the argument because it's not that kind of a reading, but I, I could see this being an, an interesting way to use hypothesis in some classes that um, where yeah you're reading you're you're kind of trying to get a bigger sense of a longer technical document. You know maybe it's a report. That, that I don't know, the World Bank has put out, or maybe it's some really long report that you want students to have a good sense of, but you don't actually need to require them to read the whole thing. So um, I just wanted to share that as another sort of way that you could, um, that you could use hypothesis. And you, I, I suppose you could also do this with other kinds of readings too. Um, the, the idea of kind of dividing it up and, and having students really hone in on different sections of a piece and then collectively sharing their knowledge based on what they, they did together. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Heron. I really like that tip of kind of dividing a really long document among students just to make it, I don't know, easier to digest as well since it's a lot of information and that could be a starting point for conversation in class as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yarsh or Dr. Huron, anything else that you would like to share today? So one of the things I wanted to talk about is kind of like, how do we pivot hypothesis away from just a, a, a class, an assignment, something that you do in a class, something that's just about reading, to getting them to think about what value they can bring to learning how to use this technology. So one of the things I do in my classes at the, in my class that I'm using hypothesis is I share with them um, a short little video about the history of this particular technology. And I think it kind of helps them gravitate towards it. So I'm gonna share that video. It's literally two and a half seconds, two and a half minutes. Um, yeah. So you guys can get an idea of what it is. And then, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I contextualize that story at the end of the semester. So let's make sure I can share it with sound because you know, if I don't share with sound, that's kind of like moot for a video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I always say this out loud so I can do it. So I'm, I'll, as I said, it's only two and a half minutes. Perfect. In the beginning, we spoke, turning thoughts into things that others could hear. Then we wrote, sharing our thinking forward in time and outward in all directions. Knowledge began to accelerate, to accumulate. We printed 
and in just 60 years, over 20 million copies of books and text were produced. An explosion that spread across Europe and into the furthest corners of the world. In 1945, a scientist named Vannevar Varbush dreamed of an early web and browser. He foresaw trailblazers that would connect the world's information. Almost 50 years later, in 1993, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina built collaborative annotation into Mosaic, the first graphical web browser, so that every page could be the launch pad for discussion of its content. And then they turned it off. Over the next 20 years, more than 50 projects tried to bring this vision back to life, but they were hindered by early technologies, short-term thinking, a lack of control over spam, and poor design. A small group of dreamers started to ask, why couldn't we do better? They imagined a revolutionary new capability, a new layer over the web, based on open standards, controlled by internet citizens instead of website owners, with a vision of serving all of humanity. They imagined the ability to point inside anything, pages, documents, pictures, video, and even data. The ability to contribute your own thinking anywhere without restriction, even when the comments are disabled. The ability to link into and share ideas and to preserve these links and connections forever. They called it open annotation. Out of this dream, a tiny nonprofit called Hypothesis was formed to bring this vision forward, working with others around the world to build software and services. These dreamers envision a more clear and honest world where comment is free and where peers evaluate each other not on terms established by those in power, but on the merit of their words and deeds. A world that's edgeless, cross-disciplinary, and emergent by design. A world that listens when you have something to say. Join us in making a better world. So yeah, well, there's some some interesting overtones in there, but I was actually really interested um, about the history of this technology because technology has a history, and and that history is connected to bigger questions and bigger structures and bigger bigger kind of things that we can do. So at the end of the semester, I I encourage my students to think about. Um, you know, they've now learned, not only have they read <laughs> content, they've now learned how to use a technology, a technology that is a company, that is a, that is potentially a career. So I always encourage them to follow the kinds of like software that they're using, that they've learned on LinkedIn, make sure they have their good LinkedIn profiles. They can follow the stuff here as instructors. Following this is really helpful because they tell us things. <laughs> so if you have a LinkedIn profile, please follow. If you are interested in hypothesis, this is a good way forward. But I also teach global studies. I'm the coordinator of the global studies concentration in CAS, um, which we're trying to expand across the university. And the mission of this organization and this company and what they're doing, I think is very much built on our values of open platforming, being part of a global community and being mission driven. So not only is this a great resource for us to use, um, when it comes to just our classes and our pedagogy, it actually has a larger kind of component to it and a collaborative effort that goes beyond just student collaboration to our collaboration and to like some of these other things. So if you learn it, you can actually start to learn it, how it's used as a, it's an open free source. Um, we have it integrated into our LMS, but it's an, also an open free source. And I know Dr. Huron started using it from that platform first and, and then students learning it that way as well. Will also, or encouraging them to, hey, while you go out in the universe, get the, the hypothesis um, attachment to your Chrome. See if some of the things you're reading on a daily basis, some people have already commented on it using this kind of screening. Um, I haven't done that yet, but I do think it's a really interesting way to think about um, knowledge dissemination for potentially for um, things like computer science. That's beyond the scope of what I can do in my classes. There's only so much I can do, but I wanna encourage them to think how can I take this beyond the classroom? How can I take this into my next development? So that's kind of how I share that as well. I love that. I love that. And I would say that, you know, one of the things I meant to say before is when I first started using this, I had students come to me and say, this tool is so incredibly helpful for me to just 
take notes on the readings and kind of keep track of what I'm learning. I want to use this in my other classes too. How do I do that? Um, and so what I said was, yes, any student, any person can for free download the um, or embed the hypothesis um, app into your Chrome browser. And so and then when you just click it on anything that you're reading online, you suddenly can annotate as well. Um, and so that and so students I, and I don't know how many students you know were actually using it outside of our class, how many ended up doing that. Um, but that's it's an incredible tool to make students aware of so that they can do that um, so that they can they can bring it into any anything that they're doing in their in their studies in their life. Um, so yeah, I think that's very powerful. And Jasmine, I love this idea of thinking about hypothesis even just as a company and kind of connecting our students um, to that work and really. I mean, I think this is something, as you said, I mean, running the Global Studies Program, we really want to encourage all of our students to, to think globally, be global citizens, understand how their work and the work that they're doing here is building on the work of other scholars, is, is becoming work that other scholars can build upon. So to really use this tool as a way to kind of drive that point home, I think is really powerful. Oh, and Kathy, to your question, um, you know, it, it has been, um, pretty cool i think most students even those who i mean if they can get on blackboard then then it's it's pretty easy to just go straight to hypothesis as long as jasmine said as long as they know to click that launch button and just kind of get in the habit of that um when they click the reading link and have, if, if they can click a reading link in blackboard then they can then they can use it so yes i've had a, a couple students have some hiccups but i've been surprised i've been impressed at how um the vast majority of students, even some who you know might be a little older, or might not have um, have the kind of comfort with technology, have been able to to really use it. I do think the phone thing is a challenge. You know, it's possible to do on your phone, but that's you know it's a lot easier to do on a laptop. And I guess the one last thing I would say is the the students that are having the hardest time with the launch button is that if you do not make it a graded item, you don't have to hit the launch button. It just opens automatically. So if you are using it as a graded item in any way throughout the semester, make them all graded items because it helps co that consistency. Again, that's probably why Dr. Huron and myself use it as low stakes um, uh, assignments. Low, and, you know, they don't have to do all of the hypothesis annotations to still get an A, to still get the grade that they desire. Um, uh, but the more they do, of course, that helps them with bigger stakes assignments, right? So substantive assignments. And I think that um, that's kind of one way to think about it. Excellent. I'm so glad you shared that video. Um, I also just added the Chrome extension right now so I can start annotating, you know, articles or PDFs that I read, because that's a great idea, right? Just taking notes for myself, um, also seeing if others have also annotated that same article. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. So before we conclude today, I do want to thank Dr. Huron and Dr. Yarish for your great expertise today. Um, I think we've all learned so much. So I do want to just kind of get a feel for the participants here. What are some takeaways or questions that you have from our session today? And as we kind of wait for questions to come in, um, Dr. Yarish, any final thoughts before we conclude today? I just want to say thank you, David, for inviting me to do this. It's great to share the stuff that I'm using. Um, I'm always like, am I doing this right? So hopefully, like some people have gotten something to take away from it. Um, uh, if others would like to talk to me about how I scaffold um, hypothesis as lower stakes assignments and how that builds on higher higher stakes assignments, happy to talk about it. We just don't have enough time to talk about everything. Um, and that is a lot of back end <laughs> brain work that uh, takes a little bit more time to talk about, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so yes, is, an, is it auto graded or do you grade each student after each annotation session? It is not auto graded and I do highly encourage everybody to turn off the auto grading function for all hypothesis because it will automatically put it in a zero for everybody, even the students that have done it, and that freaks them out. <laughs> so that is another glitch that's there. So I did, as I said, I talked about the 10 point glitch and I only use two points. So if they only do half, I put in five. If they do all of it, they get the 10, but it only registers as two points in my grade book. Um, but yes, um, it does It does auto grade if you don't click that off auto grade function. And you really need to because in order to 
it, it is a manual submission of a grade. It is definitely a manual submission of a grade. So it does create a little bit more time with grading, but if you make it low stakes, it's not a huge amount of grading energy in your brain. So that kind of helps. Yeah, great question. And, you know, Dr. Yarsh, what I learned from you is using that page notes feature to put like a rubric or criteria. Excellent, right? So thank you so much for sharing that. And Dr. Huron, any final thoughts? Well, it's just um, always a pleasure to have time to reflect on our teaching. <laughs> um, and uh, I just feel like I learned so much from Dr. Yarish. So it's it's great. I'm excited to rethink how to use this in the future and um, and to just continue to think creatively about how we use this in different ways, depending on the modalities that we're teaching in, you know, and what, what can be the best ways for our students to um, really get a lot out of this. So, um, and I, I just, I don't know. I feel like in general, if, if other folks who are, you know, part of this conversation are thinking about using it or have already started using it, I'd love to just, um, you know, continue the discussion and see what you're thinking, see what we can learn from each other in terms of how we're, how we're using it and how our students are experiencing it. Yeah, and if both of you don't mind um, also adding your emails to the chat box uh, for everyone here. Thank you. And uh, I'll go ahead and just do my quick little spiel uh, to go ahead and conclude. But thank you so much. If you do have any questions for the Cal team, um, or if you need any tech help, just feel free to send us an email. That's calhelpdesk at udc.edu. You can also check out our future office hours or our future PD or sign up for office hours. We do have uh, one coming up next week. And that is with Professor Deb Cohen from the law school. That will be next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. And she'll go over Qualtrics and how she uses that in her classroom. We also have our YouTube channel. We have over 60 recorded webinars on there currently. I'll be adding this shortly today. And also our Cal PD survey. And Dr. Yarsh, anything that you wanted to add? I think one more thing is yeah. that um, I'm very lucky because <laughs> Dr. Huron brought this to to UDC, to the Cal team, and kind of like has been a spearhead for it. And so I, we are definitely in the same program, which helps kind of communicate to students. One of the things that um, I would I look forward to doing is talking across to our faculty to see if ha how many of our faculty in our programs have used this tool. How are they using this tool? Because sometimes the, there is a communication difference for students. Like they'll just use it the way that they're using it in Dr. Huron's class and my class, but then they don't get the full points and then they're confused. They're like, but I put in annotations. I was like, did you read all the directions? And then they're like, no, I didn't. So I was like, oh, that's why. So anyway, I do think that um, if you are integrating it, there's a way to scaffold that, especially if you have more scaffolded, scaffolded majors, right? Like introducing them to this lowest of slow stakes in the intro classes. And then how do we make this more complicated as we go on? Um, and I think that that's, there's room for development there, especially if more UDC faculty are doing this, um, and, and both um, in major programs, but also in Jet Ed. So I just wanted to share that as a, a thought process for us to think about where we're we taking this kind of on the next level so it can help our students integrate the, the talent that they have, the knowledge that they have, and to build their techniques. So they're not, they're not always falling back and going, oh, well, I'm gonna do the lowest common denominator kind of thing. Very well said, and I think that's a great point to end our webinar on today. So I wanted to thank you once again, Dr. Yarsh and Dr. Huron, for joining me. Uh, this was a great session, and I also learned a lot from this as well. So we do look forward to working with both of you in the future. I'll collaborate with you more. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. Um, let me see. Dr. Carson, do we automatically turn on Hypothesis for all Blackboard courses? Yes, it's already integrated within Blackboard, so just go to that Books and Tools option click on that plus sign and that'll integrate directly right there. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yarish. So again, uh, thank you so much for coming today. We hope to see you very soon and we hope you have a great day. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you very much.